Hi, I'm Dr. Thais Aliabadi. And I'm Mary Alice Haney. On today's episode, we have Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Dr. Haver is a board certified OBGYN and a certified culinary medicine specialist. She's the expert on all things menopause. Want to know what to eat during menopause? Well, Dr. Haver literally wrote the book on it. She's the best selling author of The Galveston Diet and has a new book out, which I can't wait to read, called The New Menopause. Dr. Haver is leading the much needed conversation about menopausal health care, and we're going to get into all of it with her on the show today. Stay tuned. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for a physician's medical advice. You should regularly consult your medical provider in matters relating to your own health. Dr. Mary Claire Haver, we are so excited to have you on the show today. You are a board-certified OBGYN, a certified culinary medicine specialist, the author of the best-selling book, The Galveston Diet, and you have a new book coming out soon called The New Menopause, which I am so excited to read. You have a clinic dedicated to caring for patients going through menopause, and you have over 3 million followers on social media. And I, I, I my sister, who's a, an NP, is the first person that introduced me to you. And she's like, you've got to watch Dr. Mary Claire on Instagram. She's so incredible. You really, you know, you talk to your patients directly to all the women out in the in the world talking about menopause and in this issue that's still so unknown and scary to so many women. So we're really just so excited to have you here. And this is the famous Dr. Thais Aliabadi. Not as famous as you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm so excited to have you here. Menopause you know, hit me so hard after I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I ended up removing my ovaries. As a gynecologist, I've treated women with menopause for so many years, mm -hmm. but when you yourself go through it, right. it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. So I just want to talk about everything menopause with you. We want to learn how you treat patients and when you choose to do a hormone replacement, when you don't. So all questions related to menopause. Let's do it. I'd, I'd love to actually just back up a tiny bit and understand how, like, how did this start? How did you sure. decide to devote your career to menopause and perimenopause? So I was in a large academic uh, institution as a professor in OBGYN. I was a pro residency program director. I taught medical students. I had a large private practice through the hospital and was really happy doing that for a long time. Um, and kind of my patients were aging along with me. We'd gotten pregnant together, had babies together. You know, you kind of start and you get all the new OB patients. And then I was noticing... I, in perimenopause, was on birth control pills to treat polycystic ovarian syndrome, and I did really well on them. I had no problems with them, and, you know, so most of my perimenopause was probably masked. And then my patients are starting to have this complaint over and over and over again, same kind of constellation of things. I'm gaining weight. I'm gaining weight in new places. I'm having trouble sleeping. I'm having, you know, all these issues. And honestly, in my ob residency, we had... I'm holding my fingers up, like the tiniest amount of menopause education. And my last year of training was when the Women's Health Initiative was released. And we were all terrified to even discuss hormone therapy because of this supposed, you know, what was reported at the time is this dramatic increased risk of breast cancer. So it really wasn't part of my practice to have much of a discussion, like screening for menopausal symptoms, learning outside of the, you know, stereotypical hot flash and, and night sweats that, you know, I didn't know that menopause could affect every organ system of our body. And these symptoms could be much further reaching than genital urinary and osteoporosis. That's basically what I was taught. And so my patients are having all these complaints. These are women I went to church with, I grocery shopped with, I ran marathons with. These are not, you know, random people. These are people I have taken care of for years and I lived and worked in a community with. And who were like, look, something has changed. I am not okay. I can't, you know, their resilience has dropped to certain things. They're, they're just, and they can't put their finger on it. And I didn't have enough training at the time to really put this constellation of stuff together. I mean, you might have something similar in your training program, but we would have gynae clinic, gynecological clinic, and the upper level residents would get all the charts first and they would screen them out for the surgery cases because they wanted to get their surgery numbers. And then everything left at the bottom were the interns. So here I am, a new intern, and we're getting the whiny gynies or the whiny women, the WWs is what we call them in Texas. And 
now I look back and I'm like, we were just taught to kind of dismiss them, that they were a little bit emotional. And I mean, such a disservice when they were probably going through perimenopause and just didn't have the words to put with what was happening to them. So once I go through it, so I get off birth control pills at 48 years old to kind of see where I was at hormonally, immediately was fully menopausal. Like went from zero to 60 of just dramatic hot flashes, night sweats. At the same time, my brother had passed away and I was grieving his death and I was kind of gaslighting myself that, oh, this must be grief and I'm not sleeping because of this and I'm having pain. And yeah, there was probably a, a component to that. Absolutely. But once the grief fog started lifting like six months later, I'm still miserable. And it, then I was like, wait, when was my last period? Oh my God, I'm in menopause. Like, as this is my job and I couldn't even figure it out for myself. So that's when I got curious. It really started, you know, I was struggling with this new abdominal fat distribution. I was like, what is going on with this? I was calorically restricting, working out twice a day, still not able to get the weight loss to stick. And my husband was like, your girls are watching. So I've now she, I'm, my oldest is 23. She's in med school. Maddie's 20. She's in college, but they were teenagers back then. And they were like watching me weigh myself multiple times a day, watching me complain about my weight, watching me, uh, you know, really have all this almond mom kind of <laughs> food tendencies. And my husband's like, is this really what you want to model for the girls? You know, like you're smart, figure this out. And so that began my journey into learning more about menopause and inflammation and body changes and, you know, the whole nine yards. So I start talking about it on social media. And I mean, I wrote a book called The Gavelson Diet, basically how a menopausal person could approach nutrition. You know, I went back to school, got certified in nutrition. And then the questions just exploded. Well, what about this? What about that? What about that? And instead of automatically dismissing them, I got curious and started digging in the research and found, wait a minute, brain fog, wait a minute, cognition changes, wait a minute, depression, anxiety. None of this was ever taught to me and not really put forth. You can probably agree in our ABOG articles where we get recertified every year, there's almost never anything on menopause. And like, late, you know, you really have to seek out certification and training outside of our traditional ob residencies and that's kind of how this all happened. That is so true. And I couldn't agree with you more. You're incredible. Do you mind starting from premenopause and educating our listeners on what premenopause is? When does it start? And when, by definition, what do we call menopause? And I also just want to note really quickly that what's so crazy as we talk about this is that the one thing that every single woman will go through in her life is menopause. And the fact that as OBGYNs, you guys were literally not taught about the one thing that every woman will go through is just kind of astounding yep. to me. So yeah, really had the very most basic of education, you right. know, just, right. just skimming the surface. And part of that is why is it the busy OBGYN who is dumped with all the cardiological consequences, all the neurological consequences, all the orthopedic consequences, you know, like we have enough to do <laughs> in our day-to-day -day jobs. In my menopause clinic, I'm a little bit of a neurologist and a little bit of a cardiologist, you know? And so I really feel like menopause education needs to go across every specialty, right. all of them, and not just OB-GYN. So let's start with pre or perimenopause. Okay. So let's, let's step it back even further. Let's explain what actually, you know, why this happens to us as females versus males. So men, boy, you know, people with, with XY chromosomes with healthy testicles will, from puberty till death, will make their genetic material fresh every single day. They have, it's like factory continuing. Females are born with all of our eggs, all of our ovaries. Like the brain, we're kind of stuck with, all of the tissue we're going to have, and it's got to last us until it goes away, okay? So endocrine aging, the aging of our ovaries happens twice as fast as any other organ system in our body. We're born with all of our eggs, one to two million at birth. By the time we're 30, we're down to 10% of our egg supply. And by the time we're 40, we're down to 3% of our egg supply on average. Wait, say that again one more time. Yeah, by the time we're 30, we're down to 10% of our egg supply. And by the time we're 40, we're down to 3% of our egg supply. And menopause signifies we are out of eggs. 
The ovaries have shut down and there is no more sex hormone, very, very little, nothing clinically significant hormone production coming from that factory. The factory is closed. So menopause in medicine is defined as no menstrual period for one year after the age of 45. I really think that does a disservice. It leaves out a lot of women who have IUDs and hysterectomies who don't have periods because no one's thinking what's happening to me and you don't have that period to judge it by. So average age of Period stopping for a year is 51 in the United States, but normal 95% of women will have this happen between the ages of 45 and 55. Perimenopause is somewhere around when you're hitting, we think about the 10% egg range, maybe 12, where the usual signals from the brain, the hypothalamus and pituitary gland that are telling the ovary each month, ovulate, ovulate. Remember, our hormone cycles pre-menopausal are this monthly EKG looking thing with an estrogen surge mid-cycle and a little bit of a wave towards the end, and then this massive dump of progesterone right at the end. The whole thing bottoms out and starts over again. The signals that go, the ovary can't respond to the same level of signals somewhere in our 30s and 40s, and the brain has to work harder making more stimulatory hormones in order to get that egg to release and those hormones to surge. So we see delayed ovulations, massive surges in estrogen, big bottoming out. And so your body starts noticing something's different here. And because every organ system is affected, it's very different. The experience is very different from woman to woman, even from sister to sister. And is that why you can't really test correctly? It's really hard. A one-time blood urine or saliva test, you know, looking at things over time is, is a lot better, but we don't have a technology for that very well. I'd love to have like a CGM, like, you know, we do for glucose for hormone levels. Let's, <laughs> let's create that. That'll be the next thing that we work on. It'll be all over the place. <laughs> if I could invent something, it would be something to kind of track hormone levels consistently over time so that we could say, okay, you're, you're entering perimenopause. So that perimenopause transition from something's not right things are starting to fail to complete failure is seven to 10 years. Wow. So do the math somewhere between the ages of 35 and 45, you will become perimenopausal. Now there are things that we can do to speed that up, you know, but there's not much we've learned to do yet. There's a lot of technology happening here and, and, and innovation and how to extend the shelf life of the ovary. But right now there's a lot of claims being made with supplements and all this stuff really other than good health and, you know, supporting a, a nice, healthy milieu, there's not much that we can do to, like, push that genetically pre-programmed age of menopause further out. Can you explain for our listeners what those symptoms of perimenopause? Okay, so what we were taught in school and in training was hot flashes, right? Probably because we can't blame anything else on a hot flash besides tuberculosis, and that's not that common, right? So if a woman over 45 comes in with life-disrupting hot flashes, we pretty much know that that's related to her menopause journey. However- Or, or too much red wine at night. Too, yeah. <laughs> Sleep disruptions related to hot sweats or not- okay, to hot flushes or not, you don't have to have a hot flush to have sleep disruption and menopause. Mental health changes, new onset depression, um, new onset anxiety, worsening pre-existing mental conditions all go up. We see a fourfold increase across the menopause transition. Drop down to the heart, palpitations, both stemming from the thermoregulatory center, which can send signals to the heart, and the sinoatrial node on the heart becomes irritated. Estrogen is a really powerful anti-inflammatory hormone, and when it goes away, estradiol, we see new onset inflammation in multiple organ systems. One of the biggest ones is in the musculoskeletal system. So 80% of women will have the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause, which is basically musculoskeletal joint pain or adhesive capsulitis like we see in frozen shoulder with no injury. You send them for an MRI, everything's clean, right? They don't see any injury, but they're having pain. A lot of us in this end of the world think that some of the chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia is probably just perimenopause if you look at the age and what's going on with their hormones. So in the genital urinary system, now we have known about this for a long time, genital urinary syndrome of menopause is basically atrophy. So the vagina, lots of estrogen receptors, when those aren't you know, taken care of, we see the, thin, the walls of the vagina get thin, mucus production drops dramatically, the caliber of the vagina can shrink, we see a lot more infection and irritation, the bladder is totally affected, the urethra, so we see recurrent UTIs, sepsis, um, and all of this is so treatable, you know. Um, osteoporosis, that's another one we've known about for a long time, but 
A lot of women aren't aware that we can decrease your risk of an osteoporotic fracture by 50% with hormone therapy. The musculoskeletal system works together. So we reach our peak mu muscle mass and bone density, usually in our 30s, most women. And we get, begin a very gentle decline until we hit perimenopause and that accelerates. And so we're seeing an increased risk of frailty. All of this is preventable. You know, we're seeing osteoporosis. And so... If you develop an osteoporotic, 50% of women will have an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime. This is preventable. And if it happens to your hip, you have a 30% chance of death after the age of 65 in the first year with surgery, without surgery, 70%. And that year is marked with horrible decline. Your asthma, so we see new onset of atypical asthma in perimenopause. We see tinnitus and vertigo. So I'm, le I'm dying to find an ENT who will sit down and talk to me about this. We're seeing the gut completely changes through the perimenopause transition. So the gut microbiome changes, approaches that of a man. We lose diversity. We lose our good bugs. We lose lactobacillus, which is critical for keeping the vagina and the gut healthy. And so all of these things change. We see bloating, you know, headaches, migraines, God, I could go on and on and on. Weight gain. Weight gain, absolutely. And then body composition changes more than just weight gain because they've really looked at it. Women tend to gain weight as they age, but what's what's happening is where we're depositing fat changes dramatically. We stop becoming a pear and we move to an apple. So we start driving fat to the intra-abdominal cavity in the form of visceral fat. And listen, Curves are beautiful. Embrace them. That's your subcutaneous fat. That's probably genetic. And don't ever feel like you have body dysmorphia, you know, because you have curves. But the intra-abdominal fat that turns us into apples is dangerous. This is the fat that is linked to hypertension, diabetes, stroke, and chronic disease. And we see a massive acceleration of deposition there just from being menopausal. And at, what about hair loss? Hair loss. So there's there's female pattern hair loss and there's male pattern hair loss and there's iatrogenic hair loss. And all of these can happen, you know, through the menopause transition. Some women will suffer from higher androgens and it has to do with steroid, steroid hormone binding globulin and how when your estrogen levels drop, we don't make as much binding hormone. So the androgens, the activity of our androgens can increase. So you'll see acne, chin hairs, losing hair in places you want it. Male pattern baldness. I know your listeners, I'm pointing to my temples as more of the temporal baldness. This. Female pattern hair loss is not related to um, higher activity of androgens, and we see our parts widening. So that could be, you know, hormones, it could be genetics. There's hair loss is complicated, but we definitely see an acceleration. So it's important to understand why you're losing the hair because the treatment options will differ a little bit based on what the cause is. And the last symptom that I noticed is skin thinning. Yes. So we lose about 30% of our collagen. <laughs> you don't have to tell a perimenopausal oh, woman joy. this. A menopausal woman this. Through the, and we lose elastin and we lose transepidermal water loss increases through the menopause transition. So all of that combines with dry skin, itchy skin. We also see a lot of nerve inflammation, especially under the skin. So formication, feeling like ants are crawling on your skin. Um, people have horrible itchy ears. That's another one I see quite a bit. And like just scratching all night long. And when there's no infection or, or dermatitis, um, we see that a lot in menopause So what do too. you do about these symptoms? So you get somebody that comes in. And by the way, I went in, no hot flashes. I'm 51 years old, six months ago. Actually, it was about eight months ago before I met Thais. And I was just peeing all the time. And I was like, I have a UTI. I'm peeing all the time. And I had no other symptoms. And he's like, uh, you need to, you're in perimenopause. And, you, and I still had my period. So you know, there's all of these things that you, nobody tells you about. Mm -hmm. I forgot. Yeah. The, the urgent continence and the stress. Oh my God. <laughs> I was peeing all the time all over myself. It was terrible. So what, what do you do when someone comes into your office with okay. these symptoms? So when, when I approach a patient in menopause, I have the menopause toolkit. Okay. So it's, it's comprehensive care. Most of my patients are coming to me, fix these two or three symptoms, six, seven, eight, whatever it is that are affecting my life right now. But I'm looking down the road. I'm looking at my mom. I'm looking at my aunties and I don't want that life. I don't want to be frail and I don't have, want to have cognitive deficits. I don't want to have dementia. What can I do? And let me tell you the march to those diseases, sarcopenia, frailty and dementia accelerates when we lose our estrogen. So, you know, hormone therapy is going to go along way. So we start a discussion around lifestyle, nutrition. I have a background in nutrition. I'm able to do nutritional counseling. I have a body scanner in my office. I measure muscle mass and visceral fat. I do very directed counseling around that. So we nutrition and movement. I was a cardio queen in the 80s and 90s. I worked out to be thin. 
full disclosure, I worked out to look a certain way and I assume that was healthy. This is as a physician, okay? If I could go back and talk to my 35-year-old self, I would tell her to pick up some weights and eat some protein because I was just trying to be skinny and I was successful at it. Therefore, I was healthy. And I probably chipped away at my bone and muscle strength ridiculously for, for a cosmetic you know, way to look when genetically, I probably never have a chance of being obese, you know, and I was just wanting to be ultra thin. And so I think a lot of us kind of grew up with that mentality. And so I'm having to do a lot of counseling around resistance training, keeping our muscle strong, that will keep our bones strong. You just mentioned, do you start hormone therapy in perimenopause? So we have a discussion around each patient individually around the risks and benefits of hormone replacement therapy. And I think that through my training and in most of my practice, in general, the risks of hormone therapy were grossly overestimated and the benefits were grossly underestimated. I did not know anything about cardiovascular prevention. I did not know we could use, you know, for genital urinary prevention of, of G GSM and recurrent UTIs, you know. That kind of information was just not put forth. And I apologize to my patients back then that I did not do the work to really get out there and hustle and dig through the research to find, but I've, I'm trying to make up for that now and writing books so you can educate yourself, <laughs> you know, advocate for your own self at your appointments because a lot of docs were like me. I was great at delivering babies. I was an amazing obstetrician. I was great at gynecologic surgery, but there was definitely a huge gap in my education for menopause. Are you taking time to treat yourself? It's okay. Honestly, we all should do it. I love to get a pedicure and opt for an extra 10-minute foot massage at the end. I love to close my bedroom door and just try and take a 20-minute nap. Sometimes I even opt for that extra legroom seat on the plane. Well, if you treat yourself to the top options with everything in life, why settle when finding a doctor? It is your health after all. Enter ZocDoc, the place where you can find and book tens of thousands of top-tier doctors, all with verified patient reviews. So don't settle. Go for the best and find the doctor for you. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately. No more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. And these docs all have verified reviews from actual real patients. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat basically any condition you're searching for. The typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 72 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. One of the biggest challenges is finding a great doctor who takes insurance. If I needed a doctor and didn't have Dr. A, then I would love a platform like ZocDoc to find a doctor and book appointments easily. I spend so much of my time waiting on the phone to book appointments. Go to ZocDoc.com slash SheMD and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot -O -C com slash SheMD. ZocDoc.com slash SheMD. Let's go back to the hormone replacement therapy. So I'm a 51 and a half year old who's going through menopause or let's start there. I haven't had a period for a year. I come to your office. The way I approach my patients, I usually treat symptoms, not blood levels. So I listen to patients and if someone only has vaginal dryness, I'll treat that. If someone has uh, depression, I might uh, try an antidepressant first. Um, in my specific practice, because I went through bre breast cancer, so obviously I'm a, I, I'm a little PTSD with uh, breast cancer risk, please educate us on patients who have a um, high lifetime risk of breast cancer and patients who have been diagnosed with breast cancer or, and they're on these medications, anti-estrogens like tamoxifen or arimidex, and they come to you with symptoms of menopause. How would you treat these patients? So every patient can use vaginal estrogen without any worry of recurrence. There's zero, I mean, we have multiple studies looking at that. So immediately I launch into not only treating a symptom, but the protective benefits since eventually they're going to head there, especially if they're on an aromatase 
inhibitor or something that's lowering whatever estrogens they have even further because they're going to suffer more. Um, when estrogen is through life, is taken off the table for them through a contraindication or just a personal choice, we have to go hard on the other pillars of health and nutrition that, you know, other pharmacology to treat their symptoms. Um, if she doesn't have any, you know, what's changed in like the last two years since I wrote the, you know, since I started the research for the new book is I'm, um, especially since the American Heart Association has come out very strong here. If they're of the right age, you know, once we took that WHI data and stratified it by age, we have some protective benefits, you know, of decreasing your risk of cardiovascular disease, decreasing your risk of dementia if you start early enough. So it's a very nuanced conversation depending on what her stage is in menopause, how, what her concurrent disease, we don't want to put estrogen on top of cardiovascular disease or dementia. So those are not going to be candidates. You know, we have to look at other ways to protect her bone. and You can do vaginal estrogen for everyone, but, you know, other ways to protect her organ systems outside of giving her back the estradiol. And what is early enough? You, and I, I see that a lot in the research, which is it's the protective for your brain. For cardiovascular disease, um, the American Heart Association, when they stratified the data from the WHI, found that the greatest cardiovascular protective benefit. So if you start hormone therapy within 10 years of your menopause or before the age of 60, you will have a lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease. It's actually better than a statin for prevention of a primary heart attack. It's about a 50% decrease per year versus women who can't take it. Let's take an average American going through menopause or postmenopause, recently postmenopausal women, and um, I come to your office and um, counsel me on HRT. So I would look at your family history. So say you have no contraindications and nothing in your history that would make me worry that you have existing cardiovascular disease, right? Or existing dementia. Correct. So you're otherwise healthy. I would say, okay, um, we know that if you're having hot flashes and you're having symptoms, this is the gold standard of treatment for vasomotor symptoms. It also appears to be preventative for um, osteoporotic disease. You know, you'll have about a 50% decreased risk of an osteoporotic fracture. You will also have a much lower incidence of recurrent UTIs in menopause, as well as keeping your vagina healthy and, and resilient to trauma. <laughs> um, it will make sexual activity much better. You'll have a decreased risk of um, urgency and frequency of urination, and you will have less stress incontinence because the tissue is just healthier in general. You will probably have it if you're in the first five years of your menopause, we can clearly show that you will have a decreased risk of cognitive disorders and dementia um, if you're otherwise healthy. So that's kind of where I start. And then we talk about formulations, different you know ways of delivering it into the body, how we will track her progress. Again, I do symptoms as you do, rather than arbitrary blood levels. Um, we also have a discussion around testosterone and what the what potential benefits would be there as well. Can you go over that with us? Please? Sure. So remember that our sex hormones are the same as men's, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. We actually have more testosterone in our bodies than estrogen. And it's the precursor. So in the factories that make estradiol, the step before estradiol is testosterone. So we have plenty of that on board. When we go through menopause, we lose roughly 50% of that capability. We still have an adrenal pathway that works that works okay. So, but our estradiol will drop less than 1% of our premenopausal levels to give you some idea. So when we talk about hormone replacement, I always start with estrogen and its benefits. If you have a uterus, you must have progesterone. However, it's optional if you've had a hysterectomy or you have an IUD, but a lot of my patients are really happy with progesterone, especially if they still start struggle with sleep or nighttime anxiety. It seems to have a very calming effect there. So lots of my patients who don't who don't absolutely have to have progesterone, we're choosing to give it to them for those sleep and nighttime anxiety benefits. Testosterone is very has been studied. It's absolutely great studies to show that it does help with hypoactive sexual desire disorder in a menopausal woman. Those studies have been done. Unfortunately, the FDA has not gotten around to approving a formulation for women. So we have two options for testosterone. One is 
to give them the men's version and they use um, 10 times, 10, like 10% of the, the amount that a man would get, um, or to do a compounded version. And my pay, Texas, it's really hard to get the pharmacist here to give them the men's version that, you know, nothing, no one likes to get involved in healthcare better than a Texas state legislator or <laughs> a um, pharmacist. <laughs> like, right. And so, so I'll have testosterone compounded for most of my patients in a cream form. Off-label, and when you talk to the sexual medicine specialists, they really are like very, very, very pro testosterone in women. Um, I'm using it off label. So again, I have a monitor and my patients get bone densities. If they're coming in with osteopenia, osteoporosis, or sarcopenia, I am absolutely recommending testosterone. They still have to eat the protein. They still have to do the resistance training, but it does seem to have a synergistic effect. What are the symptoms of low testosterone? Well, it depends, you know, everything's kind of tanking at once for a woman. But one thing that like giving her estrogen and progesterone typically won't do a lot for if she has a hypoactive sexual desire disorder. But what does that mean? To explain, does that mean, because my friends that are taking testosterone are taking it because they have no sexual desire. <laughs> right. And so when we look at female sexual function and dysfunction, it's kind of five buckets that a woman may struggle and she could have overlapping. So one is a relationship disorder. If you don't feel supported, loved by your partner, then a lot of women struggle with getting your brain to say, this is a good idea. You know, I can't fix that with medication. The last thing I want to do actually is give someone medicine that's going to make them want to have sex with someone they hate. I mean, it's up to them, but you know, it just kind of yeah, seems to exactly. That purpose. seems like a good point. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes the patients say, no, I hate him. I'm like, okay, well, that's probably part of, you know, the issue here. <laughs> pain. If she's having pain, usually from atrophy or there's some other vulvar conditions, we got to fix that first. We must treat the pain because the brain is not going to want to do something that is not pleasurable. That's supposed to be pleasurable. So there's also orgasmic dysfunction. So if a patient has primary hypoorgasmic, she's never had an orgasm in her life. Do you know that's 10 to 15% of women? Wow. If that happened to 10 to 15% of men, it would be a national emergency, you know? It would be a total But national. we just calmly accept it as life and move on. And there's like very little studies or treatment. On, you know, you really have to go to someone who's like so focused on that to, to find help. And then there's arousal disorders. Arousal disorders are like you have the desire, but nothing's happening in the pelvis. And sometimes that is a nerve conduction disorder or poor blood flow to the area. And vaginal Viagra can actually be helpful there because it'll dilate the blood vessels in the pelvis and help blood flow get to where it needs to get to. But that's that's fairly rare. But most women have primary hypoactive sexual desire disorder. They used to have great desire. They still love their partner. They want to want to do it. I think we also need to normalize not wanting it and being okay with it. That's not a problem. It has to cause distress. If it doesn't cause you distress, we don't need to treat it. And so a sexual desire mismatch is a whole nother conversation where one person's up here and the other person's way down here. You know, um, there's some great books on the subject, um, Come As You Are by Emily Nagalski and uh, Kelly Casperson's podcast, um, You Are Not Broken, is fantastic. So it's it's a very complicated discussion, very nuanced. I screen for it before they even hit the door. They're filling out a screening protocol for that because I can in immediately launch into the conversation. Let me ask you a question. Can you uh, talk about testosterone pellets? Because, you know, they're irreversible. They're different than the cream or the sublingual drops. And I see a lot of hair loss with it. And as a menopausal woman, you already have hair loss. And these patients get these pellets and they come in with really high blood levels of testosterone. And I then I start treating them with anti-testosterone to fix the hair loss that goes with the pellets. So can you comment on that for us? BioT is the main company that makes the testosterone pellets, and they were developed for men for hypogonadism, for treating hypogonadism. And it became a billion dollar industry, and the physicians make a lot of money inserting them. So there's a, there's a, you know, we're, what we're seeing in our community here, and you're probably seeing the same thing, is this poor woman who's menopausal is desperate. She's going in, and no one gets. And you can put estrogen in those pellets, but you must take oral progesterone. At least most of those docs know that. That's what they're teaching through BioT. 
and they're just, they're dying. They're, they want anything. And this is the only person they can find to help them. And they're like, here, take these pellets. They're not discussing the other FDA approved options. They're all, it's pellets or nothing in these, in a lot of these clinics. And that's one of the huge problems I have. And it makes the doctors the most money. So ethically, I just think it's terrible. I went and signed up for BioT to see why the hell these women are all being overdosed. Do you know in their paperwork, they recommend, okay, frequently checking blood levels and running her between 150 to 250. That's 236 is a low normal male range, okay? So they're routinely recommending giving super physiologic doses of testosterone. The higher you go, the more likely you're gonna have unwanted side effects. When you were 25 years old and your sexual peak, you, you were like, yes, all the time, whenever that age was, your testosterone level was probably no more than 70. We don't have mm -hmm. to go that high to restore sexual function. And the higher you go, the more likely you are to have the hair, the chin, you know, the beard, the, the acne and the hair loss. And so, but it is in their paperwork to overdose the patient. I see patients coming in in the three, four and 500 range. I'm like, yes. you're transitioning. Yes, that's exactly. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, as an OBGYN, there's nothing you can do. I cannot go in there and get those pellets out. So be careful. That's why I'm so glad you did this because I see it all the time. These patients come in with levels in the 400s. There's almost like male pattern baldness, facial hair. And, and then I start, you know throwing anti-testosterones at them just to fix it, you know? So I'm glad we talked about that. Yeah. I mean, I think they can be done ethically. They're just not, you know, they, they, they are sold as this great way to make ancillary income, which a lot of physicians are struggling. You know, I see why this happened. I see the perfect storm. Women are desperate. Doctors are desperate. Here, we're going to fix everybody and everything. But unfortunately, they're not used ethically. Just to close the loop, if you have a patient with low sex drive, what do you prescribe? I know you said the cream. Can yeah. you tell us? So I'm typically doing a testosterone cyprianate powder that's mixed into a cream. That's what I'm telling the pharmacist to cook up for me. And I start at five milligrams per deciliter and we give them five milligrams per day, basically. And in the patients where I'm, you know, that we check, they stay, you know, in nice physiologic, kind of the high normal ranges. So 50 to 70. And now sometimes they don't absorb well and we have to go up. The nice thing about most of the compounded is they come in these click or pumps and we can do a little extra and kind of see how they do. Again, I'm treating the patient, treating her symptoms, trying to get her to a place where she's happy. And so without turning her into a teenage boy. <laughs> so... So can you guys both talk to me then about, because I think there's still so much confusion. You go in there, it's recommended that you do hormone replacement therapy. Is it a patch? Is it 0.5? Is it one? Do you have to have progesterone? Great, Good great. Question. Okay, so it, this is the art, not the science, because we don't have physiologic ranges we shoot for. So we're treating symptoms. So here's kind of how I approach it. When I look at how to deliver a progesterone 100%, unless she has an intolerance, I'm going oral micronized progesterone. It has the best safety profile. It's been studied all over Europe. Big study just came out of, um, just came out of Korea, just showing no increased risk of breast cancer. So I'm like, you know, nothing, not even a hint, not a whiff. So I'm like, that, that's my go to. It's cheap. It's generic. It, it's so easy. And you do hundred micrograms. I start with a hundred. Right. And I can go, we can go up to 300. So depending on sleep, I'm usually using sleep as my guide. Now, if she's going on a, Mm, again, there's an art, not a science. So I usually, for estrogen, we have oral and non-oral, okay? So oral works great. They have great, 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 great results. However, increased risk of clotting. And so I tend to stick to the non-oral forms, usually a patch, because I have five strengths I can choose from, and I can go up and down, and I and it's really affordable for my patients. So affordability is is key, you know. And so I used to love the Compi patch, but it's two hundred and thirty dollars a month, you know, depending on and and that's just out of a lot of patients' range. So between oral micronized progesterone and an estradiol generic patch, I can get them for maybe $50, 35 to $50 a month for their HRT. And um, then they can go spend that extra money on something else that'll make them happy. Can you please explain also why they need progesterone? If you have a uterus and you take unopposed estrogen, you are at an increased risk of developing uterine cancer. So in order to negate that risk, yeah, we have to give progesterone. 
Yeah. So the lining, so the uterus is a muscle bag on the outside with fibrous and muscle tissue. And then the inside is what we call the endometrium, which is glandular tissue where our periods are made each month and where the babies grow. Okay. When, if you ever get pregnant. So that endometrium is very sensitive to estrogen. And if we just gave you estrogen without the opposing progesterone, the lining keeps thickening, keeps growing, the cells keep dividing. And eventually women might develop hyperplasia or possibly endometrial cancer. And so there are conditions naturally where women don't ovulate regularly that put them at increased risk for this. So by giving you progesterone, either cyclically or daily, we can negate that risk and just take it off the table. Turns out there's other benefits, like I talked about earlier, to progesterone. So good for sleep. I lo- I'm, I'm prejudiced. I'm very biased. I love mine for sleep. So, I, I actually had noticed that right away when I started taking progesterone. I was like, it was almost, it just calmed me I have to get under the covers, like the me minute too, I take it, too, because I'll be like... <laughs> Uh, so one more quick question for those of us that are not as educated as you two. If you start, so the average woman comes in and, and to get the benefits of the heart and the brain, you're going to try to start in perimenopause. Or, or early menopause, yeah. Or early menopause. Then how long do you stay on it? Do you stay on it after menopause? What's too long to be on hormone replacement there? There's no age at which you have to come off. Once you start those cardiovascular benefits, they can continue as long as you don't have cardiovascular disease. And so it is a potential, like, if I stay healthy, I will stay, I will die with an estradiol patch on and constantly protecting my brain, my bones, you know, as much as I can get out of this thing. And so now eventually if you develop cognition issues, if, you know, permanent, if you are on the road to dementia or you develop cardiovascular disease or you develop a hormone sensitive cancer, then we must stop. You know, there are absolute contraindications that we have to be aware of, but there's no longer an age at which you have to stop. Okay. And you're not concerned about the risk of stroke past 75. So there is an increase. So when you talk to like Avram Blooming and the people who really dig into the data, they feel like when you add the estrogen to pre-existing disease through the action of nitric oxide, the sticky platelets or, you know, the, the thrombotic strokes in the brain are more about sticky platelets than an actual clot. And so, um, you know, they he feels like the women... First of all, the stroke studies were mostly done in high-dose birth control pills in younger patients. The doses we use in menopause hormone therapy are microdoses compared to that, or just like 10, 15, 20%, maybe 50 in the early years. And so um, I do think about it. I, you know, I don't have a patient in her 70s still on hormone therapy. You know, most of the time, so many other medical conditions pop up, but it is a conversation that I have that after a certain time, it it might, because of the sticky platelets and your vessels are starting to deteriorate, we may be making that risk worse. Amazing. I have an important question for you. Can you uh, talk to us about uh, hormone uh, replacement therapy through a traditional pharmacy versus bioidentical hormones? Compounding, yeah. So, so we have to understand what bioidentical means. So when you say bioidentical to your listeners, you just think estradiol. That is what the ovaries made. Now, there are a couple of other bioidentical, by that definition, hormones that our bodies can make. One is estrone. That is what is converted in our fat cells, typically, or in the periphery, in our other organ systems, to estrogen. It's a weak estrogen. It's a little bit pro-inflammatory. We don't like to have large amounts of that floating, but it does become the dominant estrogen in our menopause, which is why we think some of the disease states pop up then. Um, then we have estriol, which is made in our placentas, and they have synthesized that. It is a natural estrogen. But again, it's not anything I'm giving a menopausal patient. It hasn't been shown to be healthful. Why would I want to make her feel like she's pregnant? Um, and so, and then there's esteric, well, let's see, it's, um, there's one that's a fetal estrogen that has just been synthesized and it's in one, you know, Drug companies love them, hate them. You know, they they have to make money. And so they come up with these new concoctions and claim that they're better. So esteritrol, I think, is what it's called. Now, when you look at, like, the ovary makes more than just estradiol. There's all these little minor, minor, minor estrogens out there that may have little duties, but we don't make those, you know, estralin. And and so mostly we say, when we say bioidentical, we mean estradiol. Now, the compounding, so you can get those from an FDA, from a regular pharmacy. That's what I take. 
Now, the compounders are sometimes giving biased and triest. Now, that's a combination of estrone and estriol, the two ones I spoke about earlier. I don't have a clinical indication for that. And any claims that they're superior, they're safer, they work better are bunk. There is no data to support that. And so buyer beware, they're trying to sell you something or make claims that their product is superior when it's just not. Oh my God, I love you for this because, <laughs> you know, one misconception from my patients is I'm sure you get the same. They think if it's bioidentical, it's coming from some plant in someone's backyard. So often the precursor is yams, but you can't roll in a bed of yams and get any hormones. That's not how it works. You have to put it in a lab and do a lot of chemical processing to it. So there's a lot of misunderstanding and the wild yam cream, throw that shit in the trash. Stay tuned for part two of our conversation with Dr. Mary Claire Haver and her no-nonsense guide to menopause. You won't want to miss it. And remember, if you want to own your own health, a good place to start is by following us on social media at SheMD Podcast and by subscribing to our show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to own your own health, check out Dr. Haver's tips on our website, SheMDPodcast.com.